Thank you very much. I have to make some thank yous before I start. I was very fortunate that Abby asked me to speak at the first health conference three years ago and I feel very privileged that she invited Ian to come back and speak again and she invited me to come back and speak again and I hope I do as good a job as um, Ian's done. So many, many thanks to Abby and her passion. Also thank you to Martin Bowles and Mark Cormack who actually joined the Hargraves Institute and are uh, looking forward to us helping you on your journey through um, innovation. I must make a special thanks th though is th one of the speakers today is Natalie Pavick from Roche who is our founding member, number one, who helped start the Hargraves Institute. Natalie's sitting over here with the orange shirt on, who's waving. Um, and we've also got um, Christine Oakley from the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning down from Victoria, who's speaking next, who's also a member um, of the Institute. We tried to get the Department of Defence along to talk about what they're doing, um, but they just couldn't um, fit it in their, ch their challenge. And also thanks to Roberta, because we are mentoring the Sydney office and I spoke with the Sydney office on, um, on Friday. But the most exciting thing that we're involved with in the public sector is the uh, Institute of Public Affairs ACT Innovation Awards. And if you don't know about the Innovation Awards, I suggest you go to their website. There was 84 applicants, um, which became 12 finalists. And for those 12 finalists, we are hosting them in Sydney with a study tour across a whole bunch of innovative organisations. So next year, my recommendation is if you've done something and you're keen, apply for that award because the finalists win the prizes. Um, whether you actually then become the winner is a completely um, separate thing, but we're very, very pleased to be part of that, um, that um, initiative. But my presentation today is about getting you to do innovation. And we heard from Martin saying that collaboration and open conversation are the keys that he's after. Ian said, how can we get change in Australia that will, res that will secure our future? And Kate followed up with, inspire you into action. Well, I want to actually get you to do stuff in this presentation. So if you have a smartphone, a, pa a, a tablet computer device, you will need it in about five minutes. And we are going to get 100% uh, audience participation. So be ready. Um, so my plan is to talk a little bit about where I've come from. Um, and then I actually want to get you involved and understand who's sitting in the audience, why innovate, how innovate, what about innovation, um, and what's next. Between 1985 and 2005, every car manufactured in Australia had a part in it that I designed, developed, manufactured and sold to the automotive industry. And I'm very proud of that achievement. And thank you. And the reason wasn't that I was a great, wonderful, fantastic engineer. The reason was the world was changing. When you bought a car in 1985, you revved the motor, you looked at the engine and worked out how, much, how fast it went. When you buy a car in 2005 or 10 or 15 today, you actually look at how quiet it is. Does it have an MP3 player? Can I use my phone in it? The global trend in automobiles from 1985 to 2005 was quietness. And I was an acoustic engineer and had a very successful career because I made things that made cars quiet. And consumers today buy cars and don't even lift the bonnet. They assume there's an engine, they assume it works, but they are very, very critical about the sound quality. And that's a global trend that was a formative part of my career. You can't change global trends. At the same time, there was a bunch of engineers in Japan and Germany who were making cars just quieter to put me out of business. And as um, Ian said, there's a whole bunch of really smart people in Korea who wanted the, the global car industry to stop us making cars in Australia. And they've ach achieved that and we stopped making cars in 2018. So the most important message that I can give you with 20 years in the automotive industry is the world is changing and you can't stop it. You have to leverage it, you have to use it, but you can't stop it. And I was very successful and I left the automotive industry in 1999 because in 1999 in the, you knew that the automotive industry in Australia was dead. It was just going to take another 10 years to die. And I got out and ended up at the Australian Graduate School of Management and started studying um, innovation. And this quote is what drove me to do it. So this is Albert Einstein and I think most people would have heard this quote, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Hands up if you heard that quote, come on. 
This is an interactive presentation. It's wrong. It was said in, in 1953. This is my quote, and that's a diagram that my, one of my people did for me, which is really nice. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the same result. And that's because the world is changing so fast that what you did yesterday to be successful will not help you tomorrow. Think about when you started work in a proper job, what tools you had to work with. Did you have a computer on your desk? Did you have a smartphone? Did you have a tablet? Did you have social networking? Think about the tools you're using today and imagine what tools you'll be using in five or ten years' time. And the answer is you probably can't imagine it because the world is changing so fast, you have to change as you um, to be successful. And this is the critical driver. And we all know about the industrial revolution, the computer revolution, the internet revolution. What's happening today is the participation revolution. Everybody wants to be involved. Everybody can be connected. And in a minute, when you get your smartphones out, I'm going to get everybody connected in order to give us some feedback and the results are going to come, back, come up on the screen. This is the difference. Back in the old days, you did as you were told. In 2020, you won't. You want to participate. And I think the events of Saturday is probably a little highlight of that. So a little bit about you. I want to understand who is sitting in the room and what you're thinking and where you've actually come from. What sort of people you are out of all the different sorts of people we can have with innovation. So please take out your smartphone or tablet. Please connect to www.zetings.com forward slash Alan. Now you don't have to put Alan in capitals, you can put in little ones as well. Whether you're on a um, computer device or not, uh, a smartphone, I'll give you a minute. And what should happen is once you've connected, you'll come up with that screen. If you're on a phone, you don't need to log in. If you're on a computer, you may be asked to log in using um, LinkedIn or something, log in with whatever um, passwords, etc. you like. At the end of the presentation, I'll give you a screen and you'll be able to put in your PowerPoint, uh, your, your email address, and I'll send you the results. Okay? Please nod your head if you're at that screen. People getting there? Yeah? So while we're doing it, I will... Con I also have to thank um, James and Christine because um, Christine has given me five minutes of her presentation and James Young, who is our representative down in Canberra here, who's going to wave, James, has given me ten minutes of his presentation. So I'm He's given me ten. Um, so there are four types of people five types of people in this room, and this is where I have to turn around, and sorry, I haven't got a lapel mic. Um, you, some of you are team leaders who have innovation in your role. Some of you are team leaders who have self-nominated to be interested in innovation just because you want to. Some of you are team members with innovation in your role, you have to innovate because you've said. Some of you are team members who self-nominate, and so there are also people who are just exploring innovation and you're here because you're interested. Okay. So your phone should have changed to that slide. So the next slide I'm going to pop up is going to be the quiz and you pick, the, you pick whoever you are, press the button and we'll see what's, who is sitting in the room. A, B, C or D or E, please press yours. And the joy of technology is that our screen here we can't see the score. So can I ask our tech person at the back? Hello. What's the score of the... You can see the one right down the bottom? 19. 19? You can, everyone, everyone else can see it, I can't. Okay. Thank you very much if it falls off. So, the room is... If you add up the top two, team leaders with innovation in your role and team members with innovation in the role, you have got 46 or half the room are people that have innovation in their role. If I had have asked this five years ago, it would have been zero, or maybe two years ago, or three years ago. And the other half of the room are volunteers who are here because they're passionate about innovation and they want to try and do something about innovation. So let's just think about you and innovation for a second. So there's no more voting for about three or four slides and then there's going to be some more um, selection. How many people in the room can drive a car? 
Now I noticed that some hands didn't go up. Now that means that you, it's not that you can't drive a car, it's just that you don't drive a car and you haven't decided to learn, but you can still drive a car, true? It's just you haven't learnt to drive a car. Keep your hands up, how many people can drive a car? Hands up high. How many people can fix the car that they drive? How many people, thank you very much, all us good engineering people, thank you. Innovation is like driving a car. You can be a great driver of a car and you don't know how to fix it. You can be a great driver of a car and you don't know the theory behind it, the history behind it, you know how to drive it. Innovation is the same. You don't need to know the theory, the, the history of innovation to be a great innovator. You just need to do it. And like driving a car, you only need to know a few little instructions, get your learner's licence, jump in the car with a friend who's the most important, and off you go and drive a car. You may not be very good at the start, but you drive a car. Same with innovation. Learn a little bit and then start innovating is my recommendation with someone to help you. When you first learnt to drive a car, how many people did it in peak hour in Sydney? No. Roberta did. She told us this story and she pranged it the first time she did it. Most of the people when you learn to drive a car, you start off in the shopping centre car parking lot on a Sunday morning really, really early where it's nice and quiet and there's no cars. When you start to do innovation, my recommendation is start small. Start with a small project and learn as you go and get better as you go with someone beside you keeping you on the right and proper path. And so innovation is like driving the car, which brings my whole car metaphor together. And the thing about innovation is as Yoda, which is Abby asked me to have a link to Star Wars, no, try not, do or do not, there is no try. You cannot try to drive a car, correct? You're either driving it or you're not. You cannot try to innovate. You're either innovating or you're not. And that's one of the most important messages. You've just got to do it. You can't try. The other question is here is everyone in the room, the majority of the people in this room are drivers, correct? How many people are driving now? Zero. How many people in the room here are innovators? Hands up. If you call yourself an innovator, come on. I guarantee that everybody's an innovator. You just don't have to be innovating now. One of the secrets of innovation is like driving. You can be a driver but not driving at the moment. You can be an innovator and not innovating at a particular time. But you are still an innovator. You're just not innovating at that particular time. So what we've tried to do when I went from being the automotive industry to the Australian Graduate School of Management, we started a program at the Australian Graduate School of Management called Managed Innovation. And that was the goal in 2002. How do you manage innovation? How do you make it happen? And what drives innovation? And so I have a couple of quizzes. And this is where you do get a chance to vote again. So grab your phones. You have three choices when I put it up. What are the most critical innovation challenges facing your organisation? And you will be picking three when I give you the, the, the screen. Inability to measure or justify it. Problems with the organisational culture. Marketplace factors or factors outside the organisation. Lack of follow through on innovation. Projects are just too slow and never happen. You don't have any resources. You don't have the skills. You don't have any clear objectives. You don't have the time or the focus and you have poor execution. You have to pick three. And, if you, and, and there may be another one, but let's pick three. Off you go. This time you pick three and then press enter. 21% are saying problems with organisational culture. Lack of follow through is 11. Insufficient resources is 12. And lack of clear objectives is 13. Innovation starts with people. Innovation culture is the goal. What we do at the Hargraves Institute is we mentor organisations to how, do, how do they improve their um, innovative um, culture. This is an international survey of uh, 1,500 organisations of what they said to answer the exact same question. And the largest score is problems with organisational culture and mindset, which is exactly the same as your score. Lack of follow through, insufficient resources and lack of time is exactly the same. You don't need to have international surveys to tell you what's wrong and what you need to do. There's enough knowledge in this room to tell you what you need to do. Let's try another one. 
These are three questions you have to again, but this is about your sector. What are the most critical innovation challenges facing your sector? And we have 36 organisations here, so there's a whole bunch of different sectors that you've got to think about. Is it non-innovative culture in the sector? Sector complacency or incumbency? Lack of customer acceptance for new projects? Challenging, changing technology environment? Insufficient funding? Restrictive regulatory environment and changing consumer or stakeholder expectations? Again, you have to pick three. So, the highest score is restrictive regulatory environment, followed by non-innovative culture in the sector. Are we all nearly done? Yeah? What the global survey said, so they, they're the two highest scores. Pretty close, nothing's moving. Industry complacency or incumbency is what the um, global survey said. Restrictive regulatory environment is um, third and changing technology environment is second. And that's a very clear difference between what the private sector looks at and what the public sector looks at. And again, I'll send everybody um, these results. Last question is, what are the benefits innovation will generate for your organisation? Please select three. Better organisation in alignment, improved culture, new technologies, cost savings and efficiency gains, process improvement, improved consumer insights or stakeholder insights and understanding, benefits for image and public relations, and new and better offerings. One of the key things that I like to highlight is that most innovation that happens is all about productivity and process. The vast majority of innovation projects are about how you do your job better, as Martin said. How you do different jobs is only a small part of what you do. Process improvement, cost and efficiency gains, improved culture. When you speak to people in your organisation about innovation, don't say you want to be like Google or Facebook or LinkedIn or something like that, or you don't want to reinvent the driverless car. Innovation is about process improvement, cost efficiency gains, improving the culture of how you operate. They are actually the drivers of successful innovation and you recognise that. The reason why I wanted to do these three surveys is to show you that the knowledge is in the room. You don't need another international survey that says improved culture is the first one. Now remember that this is a, a private sector survey so I left out improved revenues. Cost savings and efficiency gains, understanding customers better are what they're looking at and you clearly know what you're looking at. So please, if you want, I'll send you a copy of um, the results. The drivers of innovation are the same. They are improved efficiency, improved processes that lead to an improved culture that makes it a better place for you to work. So how do we innovate? We know why we want to innovate. How do we innovate? So when I was at the Australian Graduate School of Management in 2000 to 2006, we were trying to write the book and all you had to do was read the book and that was actually a, fa a failing. There is no one book that you can read to become more innovative. It just does not happen that way. The world is a complex place. And so what we decided to do to understand the secrets of innovation, we created the Hargraves Institute where people share their knowledge around innovation. 12, 12 leading organisations came together and said, we just want to share. We want to understand how to do this by talking to other people. And Martin said it in his opening statement. We want collaboration and open conversation. That's how you learn about innovation. That's how the private sector is learning about innovation. And my recommendation is that's how the public sector can learn about innovation. It's all about faces and smiles. It's all about the conversations that you have with people in this room is far more important than listening to the speakers. Apologies to the speakers. Can you share a story of an innovation in your section that happened in the last 12 months? So I just want you to think back over your experiences in the area that you work, and I want you to think of anything that's happened in your area of work. I've called it a section. It can be a section, a division, a department, because we have different organisations here. Can you think of a story that you can tell about something that's happened, that's changed, that's different, that's innovation in your section? Yes or no? 
We have uh, just over 350 people in the room and for mathematics we have 66% which is two thirds of 350 people which is about 240 stories in this room. There are 240 stories in this room. And yes, there's going to be some double ups, I understand that. My point being, it's a lot. What sort of story is your story? So the people who said yes, you have to answer this question. Is it about a service innovation, a new and improved service? Is it about how you deliver service delivery, a new and different way of providing a service? Is it administrative or organisational innovation? Is it a conceptual innovation, a new way of looking at a problem? Is it a policy innovation or is it a systemic innovation, a new and improved way for parts of the public sector to operate? These six criteria come from your innovation uh, network, um, and I blatantly stole it, but you're allowed to steal an innovation as long as you put the byline up. So, for your story, which one of those items does your story fit under? We have 240 stories in the room spread across all areas of public sector innovation. So when you see a number like 15%, that is 30 to 40 stories of that type of innovation that's happening in this room. Is everybody finished? How big was your innovation that you're thinking about? Was it an incremental innovation, which means that it probably helped your team only and not, man, not anybody else? Was it a step change innovation, which means it helped the group or a larger area? Or was it something significant? How big was the innovation, your, your innovation story? Was it incremental, which is one star? Or was it really big and bold, which is five stars? So here's the challenge. Sorry, there's one more question before I ask you the challenge. Let me go back. On average, in this room, the average story is step change. It's not incremental, it's actually bigger and better than that. Okay? So, if your story is shared appropriately, would other sections, divisions or departments benefit from hearing your story? No means it's probably an incredibly specific story about an incredibly specific part of your organisation. Maybe, and yes, and they could achieve similar benefits means that somebody could copy exactly what you've done. Okay? If your story was shared appropriately with all the right rules and regulations covered. So at this particular moment in time, in this room I have 240 stories uh, that are all step change stories that rank two and a half stars out of five. 50% of them are shareable, which gives me 120 shareable stories. And if you then imagine that we got all those 120 shareable stories and we gave them to the 36 organisations in this room and they went through them, and let's be really, really tough and let's assume that, that, that when you read all the stories, 90% of them didn't apply to you. You're left with 12 stories that are step change stories that apply to your section that you can implement in your section, because you've chosen one out of 10, that implement in your section. That's one innovation a month, every month, for the next 12 months before you come back to Abby's conference next year. And there would be zero risk because every single one of those stories has been implemented by another department and you can go talk to them and they'll tell you how to do it and they'll tell you the benefits and you will have a real story. The most risky thing you can do in innovation is go up to your boss and say, hey Martin, I was sitting in the coffee shop with a couple of mates and we came up with this really great idea. Give us a million bucks and we're gonna change health. And Martin's not very happy. If you go up to Martin and say, hey Martin, we were talking to another department and they implemented this innovation and it has been working and it delivered the results and they will come and show us how to do it and we need a million dollars to do it, can we talk to you? Suddenly you've got Martin's attention because it's lower risk. The idea of innovation and risk is linked together but when you put collaboration and conversations in the two, you'll actually significantly review, re reduce the risk. Remember, I've got 240 stories Half of them 
are valuable to share. I then got you to throw out 90% of those stories to leave you with 12 that you selected that worked for your division. And that gives you one activity per month for the next 12 months. And you used zero creativity. So in the, in the um, Australian newspaper today, it says, big global conference, big Australian conference, how big companies can harness creative thinking. My recommendation, and I deal with lots of big companies, the most successful big companies don't. The most successful big companies become incredibly successful through conversations and collaboration and not taking risk because they share stories with other people and they learn from other people as compared to doing something that's pretty, um, pretty radical. And that's my key message in this presentation is you have the knowledge in this room, you have the stories in this room. There are 84 innovations that were put into the IPAA Innovation Awards and I went and, and was the judge at 12 of the, um, the finalists were presenting. And I've done that job in multiple large organisations in the finance sector, in construction, and the innovations that I saw being presented were just as good as anything I've seen anywhere. The innovations happening in the public sector, which have happened, are just as good as any innovations happening anywhere. You can do it. You've got, the you've got the knowledge, you've got the stories, you've got the information, you've just got to decide you can do it. And through collaboration, you do it at zero risk. And so one of the key things that I love is when we coach and mentor organisations, it's how you can create an innovative culture and not risk stuff and not spend huge amounts of money and waste it. So one of the key things that Hargraves has found in its research over the last 10 years is there's four types of innovators in an organisation. There are the leaders, and we know they're the leaders, they're the team leaders, they may not be the Martins because he doesn't innovate. The people who innovate are the people in the sections, the team leaders and the section leaders are the leaders that I'm talking about. And yes, there are the innovators who want to solve a problem. And then there's two other categories of people. There's a person we call the catalyst, and they are actually the most important. They are the people that make things happen, they help you. And the way we identify catalysts is just asking a simple question, and this is the one where I'm gonna get you to put your hands up. If you have a problem in your job at work, and you don't know how to solve it, and your boss and your team can't help you in that particular problem, do you have a go-to person that you would ring up and ask outside of your team and boss, who you'd ask to help you try to solve that problem or have an idea to help to try to solve that problem. Do you have a go-to person that you ring up and ask that helps you in your business, in your in your day-to-day -day job? That go-to person, you notice it's not a lot of hands in the air? That go-to person is probably a catalyst. That's probably a person that other people ask, that's a connector, that helps people. They don't do the job for you. Definition of a catalyst is a chemical compound that accelerates a reaction and is not consumed by it. So knowing a catalyst is someone who can help you in your job, but doesn't do your job for you. Then there's the last group of people, which are the peers. And the peers are the people that just happen not to be a catalyst, an innovator or a leader. They come to work every day, they do their job, and they get involved when they're asked to, but when they're not asked to, they don't get involved. They are the most important group, because they're the whole organisation. And when we do surveys, we find that 85% of the surveys are peers. They may be innovators, but they're just not innovating at, this, at, at a particular point in time. They may be too busy, they may be on a big project, but they are the critical ones because they're the ones that probably have to implement the innovation and nobody thinks about them. So when you're having your conversations and your collaborations, the most important people that you have to get involved are the peers because they're the people that run the business, run your organisation while you're innovating and they're the people that support um, what you do. And so when you want to create, and this is our Hargrave secret, a chain reaction to produce an innovative culture, what you have to do, and this is the definition of a chain reaction stolen blatantly from the um, internet, a neutron hits a nucleus, smashes it apart, creates new compounds and new neutrons. A catalyst, this is innovative culture, a catalyst is about to help a group of their peers innovate something. The peers split into innovation teams. They release the value of what they're doing. They create an activity. Um, and they then produce several more catalysts who know what's going on. And then on the reaction goes. The way you learn how to be an innovator is not going to innovation school. 
can I teach you, put your hands up if you believe that I can teach you to drive a car from a PowerPoint deck. Correct. Can I teach you how to be innovative from a PowerPoint deck? No. Can I teach you to be creative from a PowerPoint deck? No. How do I teach you to be creative and innovative? I get you to do projects and you learn as you go and as you learn you get better and then you create more projects and projects beget projects. And when we train people to be innovative or we teach them other tools, we only teach the people after they've done a project. So when you learn to drive a car, you get in there probably, with my, in my particular case, with my mum and dad. They taught me how to drive a car. And if you want to be better, then you go off and find someone who's a better driver than mum or dad, or you go off to a defensive driving school. But you do it after you've learned how to drive a car. You don't do it before you learn how to drive a car. So the secret to creating an innovative culture in your organisation is just to do stuff and learn and then do more stuff. And then the people that get engaged, you train them and you train more of them and that creates the chain reaction. And the most important projects you do to achieve your goal at the start is little projects. Lots and lots of little projects. One of the members of the Hargraves Institute in the last 12 months undertook a thousand innovation projects and they had a staff of 6,000 people. A thousand innovation projects for 6,000 people and every one of those innovation projects was implemented, collected, recorded, there was a return on investment and the people were recognised for doing that effort. And the reason why they did a thousand because they did the smallest projects you can imagine. And that gets everybody practice, just like driving your car. And let me give you two examples. I was very fortunate that I was invited to be on the judging panel for West Farmers Innovation, the managing director, Richard Goyder's managing um, innovation program, once every two years, and they had all their ideas. And two ideas stand in my mind. Idea number one was the factory um, warehouse person in New Zealand who put big magnets on his trolley so when he picked up the gas bottles, you know the big gas bottles you get for your barbecue and things like that? When he picked up the gas bottles, they stuck onto his trolley and then he could wheel them around they didn't fall off. And that was his innovation. The Treasury Group had an innovation around foreign exchange and how they did it and they saved $73 million worth of bank fees a year. And that was their innovation. Guess which one won? Sorry? Magnet Man. Because Magnet Man affected safety, it affected everybody out there in a the big wide world, and it was a significant innovation to Magnet Man. Correct? $73 million was not a significant innovation to West Farmers Treasury, believe it or not. It was just what they did, because they deal, deal in billions and billions, whatever. Magnet Man won. And that's the critical secret about innovation, is go out there and find your little innovations, get done, and then do more innovations. So I've just used up my time and I've just used up Christine's five minutes. Now I'm into James's five minutes, it's going to become ten. But anyway. So how are you going to do this? The two most important tools of innovation in large organisations is SharePoint and Yammer. How many people here have got SharePoint? How many people here have got Yammer? How many people know that it's completely free? How many people know that it's there ready to be used? How many people know that you can customise it? These are the drivers of innovation. We do far more innovation through SharePoint and Yammer than anything else. There are 45 different idea management platforms out there that you can buy to manage your ideas. And of the 45 different management platforms, and I don't sell any of them, none of them work, which is why there's 45, because everyone's trying to find the magic secret because innovation has to be business as usual. Yammer and SharePoint is business as usual. You have to integrate innovation into what you do every day. You have to make innovation part of what you do, not I'm doing my work today and stop, I've got to go into this new system to do innovation or I've got to go to this new place to do innovation. You have to do innovation in your everyday business, everyday activities, rather than seeing it as something separate. And you have the tools. A lot of people have said to me, oh, the public sector has no resources. The public sector has no, no money. The public sector can't do this. You've got exactly the same tools that the private sector's got. You can do it, and it just takes a bit of effort to do it, and um, sh showing you how to do it and whatever is actually quite simple. Once you start, then away, um, then away you go. Also, we're quite happy to give you a whole bunch of free stuff. 
So if you want to understand innovation, um, go to the Hargrave site. There's an activity called the Quest for Innovation. That was due to go up today, but it didn't. So please go and look at it in a couple of days. Um, we're not perfect as well. Um, you can go to the Catalyst website. Um, there's, a, there's a white paper around innovation, climate, uh, how you create innovation climate, how you create this catalyst um, approach. Um, and there's also the, the managed site. There's a whole bunch of information out there on the internet that you can get for free that you can actually use. You don't need to pay to have a whole bunch of people come in and tell you how to do stuff. The only risk about doing it is that sometimes the internet doesn't tell the truth. So you can trust me, you can't trust anybody else. Um, but it's all out there and it's all doable. So. That's my website. So if anyone sends me a, um, an email, alanr at hargraves.com.au, I will send you back the results. And, um, or if you've got an insight or anything you'd like to do, you can do that off your smartphone as well. Um, and I haven't used up all my time, so I'm actually be able to give back Christine some of her time. So thank you very much.